founding of union political economics, um, which I think the celebration will occur in September. Uh, and in the first issue of the journal, Mike Schweig, who is not here, and I uh, had lead articles in which we argued, I argued that uh, it's economics that was, is intrinsically reactionary, while Mike argued that it's economists that are reactionary. <laughs> of course, we were both right, and uh, right beyond our wildest dreams. You can obtain a facsimile copy of that first issue, um, which looks suspiciously like it was mimeographed, if any of you are old enough to remember what a mimeograph machine was. In the context of that, uh, that anniversary, it's a great honor to give this lecture, uh, the David Gordon Memorial Lecture, and I shall be referring in my paper my presentation to his last book, Fat and Lean. Uh, the honor is all the greater, because not, not only is it in honor of a very important person in the development of progressive economics, but it's the people who've given these lectures that means like a roll call of outstanding, it is a roll call of outstanding progressive economists. Uh, Dean Baker, Janet Shore, Thomas Weisskopf, Duncan Foley, Nancy Fulbray, Min Kui Lai, Gary Dim Epstein, Bill Darity, Jim Stanford, David Laidman, Anne Markinson, Michael Perlman, Doug Dowd, and Bob Pullman. And it is a great honor to be included in that list. Well into the 21st century, it's difficult to find a country, particularly a country in the Western world, where democratic institutions are not under attack, and in many cases, severe attack. In the United States, the government's fallen under control of a profoundly anti-democratic regime. In Europe, long-standing authoritarian tendencies have enjoyed a quantum leap under the neoliberal austerity regime fostered by the German government under the cover of the European Commission. I say that with great regret because I was quite active in the campaign <coughs> to keep Britain in the European Union and remain a supporter of Britain being a member of the European Union, though the possibility is fading by the day. The, the draconian austerity measures that were imposed upon Greece are, represent the most obvious and extreme example of the mainstream authoritarian trend in Europe. Authoritarian governments and movements now hold power in Poland and in Hungary. Successive elections in, this, in, last, in the last calendar year include the rise of neo-fascism in Germany, 13% of the vote, near elimination of the center-left and a hard right government in Austria, the home of a very famous fascist. <coughs> the imposition of direct autocratic rule in Catalonia by the right wing Spanish government, and the electoral triumph of a hard right billionaire in the Czech Republic. Outside the European Union, the efforts of the government of Europe's largest country, Russia, their efforts to undermine democracy in the rest of Europe are well documented. The few developments supporting of democracy come in Spain with participatory and uh, progressive Podemos, and I'm pleased to say with hope in Britain, where the Labour Party 
has shed its neoliberal past, recent past, to re-embrace social democracy and is at least level, sometimes ahead in the polls. Beyond North America and Europe, no major country counters the authoritarian trend. Not China, or the government, is involved in transition from authoritarian socialism to authoritarian market system. Not in India or Brazil, where brief flowerings of, uh, of democracy, in the case of Brazil, have been overturned. Not in Vietnam, where I worked for 25 years, where you have an authoritarian government, only mildly less repressive than in China. And of course, the Philippines, which has a shockingly, it's called pacifist, populist, but in fact <laughs> is a neo-fascist. What is the source of this near universal tendency towards authoritarianism. At the end of World War I, now a hundred years past, that, the end of that war ushered in a rise of authoritarianism throughout Europe and beyond Europe too, but I'm just going to refer to Europe at the moment. The Great War, as my parents called it, was the most catastrophic conflict in in history. Ten years later came the most devastating economic crisis in human history. The excesses of capitalism and the apparent incapacity of, rep rep of representative democratic governments to deal with those crises led to a disillusionment with democracy with bourgeois democracy, a term used both by revolutionaries in Russia and by Mussolini in Italy. And the revolution in Russia brought a government committed to a form of governance in the interest of the working class and peasantry, but bit by bit degenerating or transforming into a thinly disguised authoritarian rule. In Italy and Germany, this crediting of bourgeois democracy led to unabashed dictatorships that celebrated their authoritarian nature. The regimes proved appallingly successful in crushing labor movements and rolling back the principles of the Enlightenment itself. The structure of these savage regimes required a war even more catastrophic than the previous. In the wake of economic depression, fascism, war, and consolidation of the Soviet Union, who, which, by the way, was the principal agent in the defeat of fascism, there developed a near consensus <coughs> among mainstream political parties, particularly in Europe, but also to a great extent in the United States, that these disasters were the result of the excesses of capitalism and these excesses of capitalism had to be constrained and contained. During its brief life, this consensus maintained that stability and consolidation of capitalism required a control, control mechanisms to prevent the excesses of the economic system, excesses generated by competition, which Marx called the inner nature of capital. In the immediate aftermath of World War II, this recognition of the excesses of capitalism was so widespread, it's hard to believe now, and particularly for the young people to believe, but in 1946, an economist named K.W. Rothschild, who was a professor at the University of Glasgow, wrote an article in the Economic Journal, leading economics journal of the time, called Price Theory and Oligopoly. If you teach mac microeconomics, you should certainly put that 
article on your reading list. In 1947, I think I said 46, in 1947, Rothschild wrote the following. When we enter the field of rivalry between corporate giants, the traditional separation of the political from the economic can no longer be maintained. This is in the leading economics journal of the time. Fascism has largely been brought to power by this very struggle in an attempt of the most powerful oligopolists to strengthen through political action, through political action, their position in the labor market and vis-a-vis -vis their smaller competitors and finally to strike out in order to change the world market in their favor. Rothschild goes on to say, a theory of competition can be complete and relevant only if its framework <coughs> includes all the main aspects of the struggle by corporations for security and position, like price wars, open imperialist conflict. Can you imagine reading that in an economics journal? Now? Open imperialist conflicts still will not be the daily routine of the <laughs> oligopolistic market, but like price wars, their possibility and the preparation for them will be a constantly existing background. And the imperialist aspects of modern wars or armed interventions must be seen as part of dynamic market theory, just as the more traditional economic activities like cutthroat pricing. There is no fundamental difference. That's not a Marxist writing, but it could be a Marxist writing. That was a social democrat writing. The rise of financial capital, which began in the 1970s, has returned us to the capitalist authoritarian, authoritarianism that flourished in the 1920s and 1930s. The current authoritarian tide in Europe, in the United States, and in Asia comes from the excesses generated by capitalist competition, unleashed and justified, however now, not by fascism, but by neoliberalism. Neoliberalism pretentiously claims to be the guarantor of freedom. Free market, free men was the name of an infamous lecture Milton Friedman gave in London in 1974 <coughs> to the London businessmen. And I say businessmen because there's a photograph of his speech, no single woman is, is in the uh, auditorium. The reality, of course, is quite the contrary. <coughs> Neoliberal market re-regulation over the last 30 years has destroyed freedom. I careful, I'm careful to use the term re-regulation, not deregulation. During the New Deal period, during the European post-war social democratic period, social democratic and Christian democratic, I would say, to give the, uh, to give the center right its due, Governments regulated capital in the specific sense of limiting its freedom of movement. That's what the control, the limitation of capital was about. Limiting its freedom of movement. Limitation, and this included tariffs, non-tariff barriers, limitations on conversion of national currencies, strict oversight of financial institutions, Constraining, which constra all of these constrain the form and intensity of competition. The explicit <laughs> purpose of these regulations was to prevent the free flow of goods, was to prevent the free flow of capital. Neoliberal re-regulation is not the reverse of that. The neoliberals do not stop at eliminating what the New Deal and the Labor <laughs> and the Labor government of 1945 <coughs> and uh, parties in, in Germany and France and other places, they don't stop at eliminating that. They have something much bolder in mind. Neoliberal re-regulation replaces them with different legal rules, ones that facilitate the collective power of capital 
and undermine the collective power of labor. Neoliberal re-regulation is in effect, or should be thought of in the following. The New Deal sought to regulate capital. The New Deal was a vision of the, in which the government regulated capital. The neoliberal agenda is one in which capital regulates the government. It doesn't cut itself free of government regulation. It re-regulates the government, or to use a neoliberal, favorite neoliberal term, reform. It reforms the government, re-regulating it in the interest of the capital, in the interest of capital. The central purpose of the neoliberal re-regulation is to remove economic policy from the control of democratic processes. <laughs> Perhaps the clearest example of enforcing the restrictions on neoliberal or <coughs> neoliberal agenda to enforce restrictions on democratic government is what in Germany is called ordo liberalism comes from two words, order, liberalism. The order part is that there will be rules that restrict the actions of governments such that governments cannot violate the principles, the key principles of neoliberal economics. So it's ordo, liberalism. And to be very specific, an example uh, of these are limits on fiscal deficits. So you have a rule that restricts governments, restricts elected representatives from changing or from altering budgetary processes, confines them within very strict limits, and those have just been strengthened by the European Commission on December the 7th by what, what we would call over here an executive order, what they call their secondary legislation, which now enshrines it for every member of the European Union whether or not it has actually adopted the rules in question. Examples in the United States of the same thing are the um, Budget Enforcement Act of 1990, uh, which uh, the, I'm sure you know better than I, uh, but uh, uh, enforces certain rules in the case of expenditure that uh, you must demonstrate uh, how expenditures will be financed. And um, inflation targeting rules for the central bank. These are very much in the ordo liberalism tradition, and their purpose is to restrict the ability, the scope, for governments to implement the will of the majority, put it bluntly. So therefore, the broader context of the neoliberal agenda is to include the intervention of governments in support of capital and the implicit support of, of governments for the de direct application of violence by labor against capital. I want to make clear, I'm not here arguing that large corporations are nationally based. They use whatever government is available to them. They use whatever government is, <coughs> would facilitate the particular activities that they seek to carry out. So harking back to Rothschild's point, we should not think of the competitive struggle as primarily an economic process with occasional intrusion by government. 
Rather, it is a conflict in which economic and political <coughs> factors are integrated. For example, when you read of negotiations in the European Union about deepening the so-called single market, these are basically arguments among the representatives of large corporations seeking to gain advantages for their companies. So you have some rules that are clearly in the advantage of capital in particular countries, and you have some compromises too, recognizing that <coughs> the, uh, the cap be too uh, dominant. When we consider the process of competition, it is quite important to distinguish between industrial and financial capital. Productivity increases can serve as a major, even a primary instrument to enhance the competitive position of industrial capital. <coughs> and that is never independent of non-economic factors in competition, but it can be a major element, and in certain periods is the major element in the competitive struggle. However, that is not the case for financial capital. Financial capital does not require to gain its profits, it does not produce objects, useful or useless, nor does it produce services. So therefore, it has no <coughs> vehicle by which it can increase productivity. It is, in effect, a tax on private production. In consequence, the enlistment of government intervention in the competitive conflict always important for industrial capital, provides the only vehicle for financial capital. Unable to engage in what Marx called the civilized warfare of the cheapening of commodities, financial capital must engage governments as its continuous and constantly intervening partner. In the era of industrial capital, the possibility existed for progressive regulation of competition that combines, excuse me, confines the competitive conflict to that civilized warfare. So as long as productivity change represented a major vehicle for the competitive struggle, industrial capital could live within a regime in that a regulatory regime which sought to confine competition to that realm, namely the economic realm. This is never an outcome that would be chosen by capitalists, but when working class and mass movements are strong, it is one that they must accept whether they want to or not. But that progressive outcome is unacceptable to the financial capital. Ideologically and more importantly by the nature of its reproduction, financial capital lacks the degree to a substantial degree. It lacks the ability to raise its profits in any way other than the reallocation of value-added through the process that I called private taxation. The attempt by government to restrict financial capital, the attempt by government to restrict the mechanisms of competition of financial capital, in effect, would destroy financial capital or reduce it to an organ derivative from industrial capital. This leads to the process of the, what I call the decommissioning of democracy. I've already mentioned uh, some examples of it, but I will now 
go more into detail. Financial capital is not anti-government. It seeks to reconstruct, as I said, reform government. It's, it is capital regulating government. Its regulations consist of establishing, as I said, establishing restrictions on what governments can do. You might think of financial capital of ha as having its own First Amendment. As you know, the First Amendment begins, Congress shall make no law. Financial capital's First Amendment begins, governments shall take no action to limit the movement of capital. The implied prohibitions on government <coughs> actions decommission electoral democracy. And we see it in actuality. The purpose of destroying the post-war post uh, regulatory consensus was to liberate financial capital from the constraints that prevented, in effect, it having a full flowering. The Keynesian Revolution, though there are a lot of other people involved, and I'm very hesitant to ever use the term Keynesianism. Uh, the, in the United States, really, we should talk about it as Hensonism after the uh, great post-war um, uh, economist, or Kaleski, uh, uh, <coughs> someone who had theoretically at least <coughs> the same level uh, as Keynes. These and many others provided straightforward, logical, theoretically sound tools by which elected governments could pursue the welfare of those they govern. The most important of these macroeconomic instruments were fiscal policy, monetary policy, and management of the exchange rate, The Keynesian, Hansen, Kaleski, etc. view of countercyclical policy provided the core of that approach to managing the capitalist economy. That was then combined slightly later by the Tinbergen Rule, which provided another sensible proposition, <coughs> namely that if you had Ten policy objectives, you needed ten instruments in order to effectively implement them. Uh, I'll just say the brief aside, uh, maybe many of you know, Jan Tinbergen was a hero of the Dutch resistance against the Nazis. Uh, a far cry from most of the other people who received the Nobel Prize down through the years. <coughs> I don't think many of the people in the University of Chicago were important in the resistance against the Nazis, but I could be wrong. Uh, <clears throat> active discretionary use of policy instruments in fiscal policy, monetary policy, exchange rate policy, established barriers to the hege hegemony of financial capital. Public taxation is in direct competition with the private tax function of rentiers, the financial rentiers. Monetary policy in support of an active fiscal policy limits the extent to which central banks can serve the interests of financial capital. Fixed exchange rates, and more generally, government managed exchange rates, undermine one of the greatest sources of financial uh, profit, speculation, uh, <coughs> to Achieve its hegemony, financial capital required a deactivation or decommissioning of all three public policy instruments. In the case of fiscal policy, you may recall, uh, maybe you, most uh, none of us are old enough to have been around when the, or to remember the actual fight over the Full Employment Act, but. Uh, some of you may have read the Full Employment Act of uh, 1946, the preamble of which says the following. 
U.S. Congress hereby declares that it is the continuing policy and responsibility of the federal government to use all practical means with the assistance and cooperation of industry, agriculture, labor, state and local governments to promote maximum employment production and purchasing power. Now, it is true that there was a very big fight. The progressives wanted that to read to promote full employment, and uh, maximum employment was the compromise. But still, for now, pledging maximum employment looks pretty good to me at any rate. Mainstream economics has provided the ideological justification, or ideological cover, we might say, for political moves in the U.S. Congress to restrict the federal government from active fiscal policy. As I mentioned, the uh, Budget Enforcement Act of 1990, and there are others. The function of this and other legislation is quite straightforward, to remove fiscal policy from the democratic process. If you can't directly get rid of democracy, <coughs> then what you do is you restrict, legally restrict, the ability of governments to make fiscal policy. And then you can pretend that you still have democracy. I just might note, under pressure, uh, the great extent from the German government, 27 26 of the 27 members, leaving out Britain, of the European Union have enshrined balanced budget laws into their constitutions. So not only is there the Treaty on the European Union which enshrines these rules, each country government is forced through, including Social Democrats in Spain and the Zapatero introduce, in effect, balanced budget into the Constitution. <coughs> the ideology of financial capital seeks, or the ideology within the ideology of, of uh, financial capital, these odious and reactionary restrictions on government action are justified on the grounds that if you didn't have these rules, you would have feckless, populist governments spending like drunken sailors, driving up the public debt, <coughs> and generating inflation. Of course, what is really meant, what the word populist there means, and I think it's a, it's a term that progressives should probably never use in any context except a positive context. But, but what is meant by populism in that context is democratic regulation and oversight. So what you want to do with the rules is get economic policy out of democratic oversight because that will lead, might lead to the restriction of financial capital. <coughs> Fiscal policy decommission, <coughs> let's make monetary policy unaccountable. That is what independent central banks are all about. The conventional wisdom holds that central banks must be independent because otherwise those same feckless governments that I mentioned before if they will come on, if they control the central bank they'll be monetizing a deficit generating uh, inflation and that will is a very serious economic uh, perversion and the only way to do something about that is by making the central bank independent of political influence. I should say here as a, uh, as a footnote or as an aside, 
Actually, the U.S. law on the Federal Reserve System is far, far better than, for example, the laws established in the European Central Bank. Though things may be different in practice, in the law, the U.S. Federal Reserve System is not required to target inflation. What the wording says is stable prices. Also, it is required to have on its board representatives of the public, while the European Central Bank on its board are the central bankers from each government, from each member country. In fact, in the progressive period <laughs> under Roosevelt and through uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson, you had, and I think through Nixon too, you had representatives from trade unions on the um, uh, federal uh, board of the Federal Reserve System. Having said that, I'm not singing the praises of that system because it obviously can be perverted and it has been and is, but it does demonstrate that <laughs> the I the possibility of a more accountable central bank um, uh, is there. Eliminating exchange rate policy. Some of you, I think, are probably old enough to remember 1970 when the, uh, when the dollar, uh, when uh, Richard Nixon uh, announced that the dollar would no longer be converted in gold. After some turmoil, this led to uh, the uh, uh, an early version of the floating exchange rate system we have now. This was absolutely crucial to the rise of financial capital because bit by bit it implied the free international movement of capital. Almost every great progressive economist, Keynes uh, very famously, has warned against free movement of capital on the international scale. <coughs> and they're right. In addition to facilitating speculation, flexible exchange rates lead to domestic instability, which can cause, uh, create opportunities or an enabling environment for uh, speculation in large countries such as the United States uh, can be destabilizing in uh, medium-sized countries uh, such as Britain and can be catastrophic in a small country, uh, Cyprus being an obvious example. And this is not just, as I'm sure you're aware, idle speculation. Last September, speaking to the UK Labour Party Congress, the Shadow Chancellor, John MacDonald, <coughs> said, what if there is a run on the pound? Ninth largest economy. The person who would become the equivalent of the Secretary of the Treasury is speculating on the devastating of possible devastating effects of a run on the currency should his party be elected. What if there's a run on the pound? I don't think there will be, but you never know. So we've got the scenario plan for that. People want to know that we are ready and they want to know that we've got a response to everything that could happen. And he could not be more right because Britain is home of the world's largest concentration of predatory finance capital in the city of London. It is the world's largest center of money laundering, and much of it is drug money and terrorist money. But they are common criminals compared to the financial capitalists themselves. Drug dealers and terrorists and cause terrible damage. But the city of London could destroy a government and an economy through the so-called 
judgment of markets. What you might call the nuclear option open to financial capital. In this context, discussing the decline of democracy, I need to begin to wind up with a, at least an explanation that is not at the top of, of, why, of why democracy and how democracy will convert to authoritarianism. And I would characterize this as the end of class rule by consent. If I can quote from David Gordon's fat and mean, he writes, the wage squeeze has broader consequences. He is here talking about the 20 years of decline in wages when he wrote this book in 1996 and was published next year. It sends tremors through the entire communities, eroding their stability, ripping their social fabric. The frustration and anger it provokes begins to attack the body politic like a plague, spreading virulent strands of cynicism, discontent, of disaffection from government and hatred. This is a very important insight <coughs> because it helps take us from the decommissioning of democracy and policy making to the transition from formal democracy to formal authoritarianism. By formal democracy, I mean those countries in which there are uh, democratic institutions that are uh, representative institutions that are contested, that have in the past or could in the future serve as intermediaries between the governed and the government. In no country in North America or Western Europe has an anti-capitalist revolution <coughs> led to government. All of them, however, have passed through a period in which progressive forces had great strength, led by the trade union movement, and, the, and these governments have established substantial limitations on the power of capital. A major component of those limitations has been establishing the principle that employees should share e equitably in the expansion of the national economy. In almost every country, biases against ethnic groups, gender discrimination, regional animosities have limited the scope of the equity principle in some cases, quite a bit. In some cases, relatively little. In North America and Europe after World <coughs> War II, struggles against a many forms of discrimination have had some success in broadening the equity principle. It is the key element in the American dream that as you work hard, you get rewarded. The rich man rich woman will be rewarded more, but you will get your share. <coughs> there will be a fairness that the economy will reward everyone, or almost everyone, who works hard. That has led since the 1930s through the early 1970s <coughs> to what I would call Class rule by consent. Class rule by consent involves a system in which of private property, in which the many work for the few. Second, in which there are workers' organizations and popular organizations that will enforce upon the capitalist class an equitable distribution of output and leaving three, number three, a capitalist class which has no choice but to accept it temporarily. And that pretty much characterized the United States for about 40 years. 
But it was always, as we know now, accepted begrudgingly by the capitalists. And as soon as they had the opportunity to <coughs> throw it, they began to do so. The equity principle was the basis of the New Deal coalition formed by Roosevelt in the depths of the Great Depression, continuing through Johnson. The policies to achieve this had a common theme. How did you enforce the equity principle? You did it through restrictions on the market, restrictions on corporations, to prevent antisocial consequences of capitalist competition. It included trade union rights, anti-monopoly laws, strict limits on financial capital. Neoliberalism was and is the antithesis of the New Deal political economy. In contrast to preventing the antisocial excesses of capitalism, it celebrates them as triumphs of competition. And as the United States entered the 21st century, decades of increasing inequality caused falling working class income, stagnation for the middle classes, loss of hope in fulfilling the American dream, which was really only a dream for white people. Uh, uh, in fact, increasingly undermined faith in U.S. democracy. In 1932, Franklin Roosevelt came to the presidency facing a similar crisis, a crisis of confidence, belief in, commitment to democratic principles. When Roosevelt became president in 1933, U.S. income inequality, measured by the Gini coefficient, was over 50. At the end of his second term, it was down to 44. At the time of his death, it was down to 37. Much of that big jump between the end of the second term and his death was, of course, brought about by the high taxation and price controls and other controls introduced during World War II. It would not, when, it would be 1982 before the Gini coefficient would again go above 40. So for about 30 years, you had the equity principle in operation and formal democracy. But rising inequality is bringing that to an end. Rising inequality here and in Europe, particularly in the United States, has revived social divisions, subsumed in the, uh, in the golden age. Donald Trump encouraged and exploited those divisions to become the vehicle for the transition to authoritarian capitalism. And here, perhaps not vehicle, it comes to mind a word that um, Churchill used to describe Mussolini, in which he said he was the utensil of fascism. Donald Trump is the utensil of neoliberalism running its course. I would like to conclude on the four freedoms. Again, with a reference to Roosevelt. 77 years ago, in his third inaugural address, Roosevelt defined the ongoing world conflict in 1941 as a struggle to protect and guarantee the four freedoms. Freedom to worship, freedom of speech, freedom of fear, and most radical of all, freedom from want. Think about freedom from want. People shouldn't be hungry. They should have decent housing. <laughs> they should have to be decently uh, uh, educated and so on. We have by accident, or maybe not by accident, 
a four freedoms for the neoliberal era. And they are in fact called the four freedoms. If you read documents about the European Union, you will see repeated reference to the four freedoms, which are essential to the single European Act, which was 1987. So, Roosevelt's four freedoms was the rights of people to worship, freedom of speech, freedom from fear, freedom from want. What are the four <coughs> freedoms in the single European Act? Free movement of capital. Freedom of any institution to bid for government services. Freedom to privatize. Freedom to buy and sell anything across any border, regardless of its conditions of production, as long as they're within the environmental rules of the European Union. And the free movement of people, which in this which in principle I support, which in this context, however, frequently means the freedom of capital to drive wages down. These are indeed the four freedoms of the neoliberal world. They are the movement from the sublime to the ridiculous, or from the sublime to the grotesque. An earlier period heralded the hope of human liberation. The four freedoms of our era herald the liberation of capital. The struggle for democracy at all levels is the struggle against the liberation of capital. That's what our struggle is about. Capital must be placed under permanent house arrest, its freedom severely limited and only allowed to operate under close supervision. The citizen's arrest of capital requires many policies. And I will just mention four in my concluding moments. One, active fiscal policy, <coughs> counter-cyclical fiscal policy to maintain economic stability at a high level of output and employment. However, <coughs> the attempt to do this is certain to provoke insurrection in the financial sector and perhaps capital flight, as John McDonald mentioned. So the second rule, rule, legal terms. We require public control of the financial sector through public ownership, either through direct public <coughs> ownership or through restrictions on the profitability of um, uh, manufacturing sectors such as mutual societies, savings and loan associations, and so on. Third, a mechanism to eliminate unemployment as a disciplining force. And probably the best way to do that is the, what is called the universal basic income. However, in order to avoid <coughs> mitigate against the individualistic ideology of basic income, social democrats should not in general create policies which foster consumerism in order to mitigate against that many programs of public provision of non-food necessities, public housing, free education at all levels. 
free health. I'm going to just say uh, exactly what I mean by that. There's much talk of single payer uh, health insurance in the United States. A great Welshman named Nye Devon was the leading light in the creation of the national health system. And the legal document establishing the national health system says health should not be an insurance based system. It should be the right of every citizen free at the source of delivery. That is the social democratic principle. And it may be far off, but that's what we have to keep in mind. And finally, fourth, the basis of all the others, guarantee of workers' rights, guarantee of the right to organize, guarantee of the right to strike. As a trade union friend of uh, mine uh, said, uh, you, have a, you have a right to strike the United States, you have a right to be fired. <coughs> you have a right to strike, <coughs> right to organize. For 250 years, citizens have struggled to restrict, control, or eliminate the ills generated by capitalist competition, the exploitation of labor, class and ethnic repression, uh, repression international armed conflict, the spoiling of the environment. When a progressive majority has allied, this struggle has made great strides. And I should say in that context that those four elements that I said are necessary to make a citizen's arrest of capital, they all appear in the Labour Party Manifesto of 2017. All but one, and the one that's not there, will, ap will, will appear in the next election manifesto, which is being processed and written now. This is not <coughs> idle speculation. The Great Depression of the 1930s, quickly followed by World War II, generated broad consensus in developed countries. The consensus focused on the need for public intervention to protect people against instability and criminality that results from the accumulation of economic and political power by great corporations. Franklin Roosevelt, if I may quote him again, four times our president, addressed Congress in 1938 and said the following. Unhappy events abroad have retaught us simple truths about the liberty of a democratic people. The first truth is that the liberty of a democracy is not safe if the people tolerate the growth of private power to a point where it becomes stronger than their democratic state itself. That, in its essence, is fascism. We the citizens in the advanced industrial countries, the United States, the United Kingdom, other countries, have reached the point where private power is stronger than our democratic state. The private power manifests itself in unrestrained corporate greed that overrides democratic decisions, justified by an ideology of self-adjusting markets. Rejection of that ideology requires radical reform to prevent financial capital from creating fascism. To prevent fascism, we must implement a citizen's arrest of capital that will liberate the many, not the few. Thank you. I was, a, I was a student of David Gordon's uh, when I was at the New School. He taught me econometrics, and I guess I did all right in that class, but I'm pretty sure I got on his nerves. Uh, but I, uh, 
I have a lot of respect for him, and uh, I admired him a lot. And uh, in particular, I admired uh, what he did to help build up an alternative to uh, economic orthodoxy uh, and, and lay an institutional foundation for the work that, that we all do here. So I'm, I'm very pleased to be delivering these uh, discussing comments. Uh, so, when ERPI was founded uh, nearly half a century ago, many of its members, uh, I'm sure, regarded bourgeois attitudes as uh, retrograde, as impediments to progressive change. So today, in 2017, I suspect that most of the people in this room would warmly welcome the restoration of simple bourgeois decency and common sense to our political discourse. Uh, and my brief remarks uh, will be concerned with the tension between those values, those bourgeois values, and capitalism's uh, inner logic. Because I think that tension uh, is, in a sense, the subtext of John Weeks' uh, illuminating lecture. Um, I don't have any serious disagreements with uh, uh, anything in, in John's argument. I think it's a splendid diagnostic report on where we stand today how we got here and how we can move forward, how we should direct our efforts in, in moving forward from where we are now. <coughs> so I've always found the term free markets rankling. Uh, it's, it's a heavy-handed but effective propaganda strategy. Uh, it's aimed at forging in people's minds a very tight ideological link between the concepts of human freedom and the market system. No, free market, it's free, it's great. What's, what's better than freedom? Um, John Weeks reminds us that Milton Friedman, one of the shrewdest uh, rhetoricians of our discipline, uh, wrote of free markets for free men, um, as though there ever was or ever could be a capitalism without the nation state. Uh, from its earliest mercantilist phase, capitalism has relied upon the state to establish the rules within which uh, competitive processes play themselves out. The mercantilist state enforced conditions that facilitated the primitive accumulation that financed the factory system and early industrialization. Protectionism in the early decades of the American Republic laid a necessary foundation for the development of a robust manufacturing sector in the northern states. And then imperialism provided markets and raw materials for Europe's capitalists during the 19th century. After two world wars uh, put an end to the imperialist phase, military Keynesianism stimulated demand during the so-called golden age. Uh, the state opens markets, it establishes rules and infrastructures that enable those markets to function effectively, not least for the capitalist class. And on occasion, the state is called upon to rescue the entire system when financial recklessness or catastrophic demand failures threaten to bring the whole edifice down around our ears. Uh, so debates about economic policy or about, how to, or about how to organize our economic system essentially center around the question of how much of the heavy lifting should be left to the market. And that's a question uh, about which I think reasonable and well-meaning people can have hold widely different views. Markets are undoubtedly useful institutions. Uh, they penalize certain types of waste and stupidity. And you know, of course, uh, we now know from behavioral economics and history that anything that penalizes waste and stupidity is kind of useful. And uh, Marx noted that in the capitalist age, markets harnessed uh, human productive capabilities to a degree that no earlier form of socioeconomic organization had uh, dreamt to achieve. I'm always peeved when my, my free market friends uh, point to the, you know, the, the hockey stick, right? The great trajectory of, of income uh, that uh, followed the onset of capitalism as though that's an argument against interventions in the market. As I always tell them, well, okay, but Marx already pointed that out in 1848. There's no, we don't have an argument on that point. That's, that's something that uh, 
that leftists uh, concede. Uh, but like all human institutions, markets can be dysfunctional in various ways. Uh, they do penalize certain forms of waste and stupidity, and they foster others, uh, notably environmental degradation. Uh, uh, of course, healthcare in the United States is a prime example of how uh, markets uh, foster uh, deeply embedded inefficiencies and, and irrationalities. Uh, Many economic actors experience the market not as an invisible hand, but as an invisible fist. Uh, it's a cliche, but it's true. And we're all familiar by now with problems of asymmetric information, moral hazard, adverse selection, and so forth. And those are just the, the, the caveats from the mainstream end of the spectrum. Marxists, post-Keynesians, and other dissenters from mainstream orthodoxy have diagnosed a lot of other problematic features of the system. And because the rise of capitalism was accompanied by, here I'm getting to democracy, uh, because the rise of capitalism was accompanied by the displacement of uh, monarchical rule by republican systems of government, the resolution of these dysfunctions must involve political activity of some sort. And here we come to, to the issue of the connection between capitalism and the emergence of, of democracy. Uh, uh, that, that connection is no doubt complex, and it, it lies beyond my field of expertise. But I think it's very likely that democracy as we understand it is at least partly a byproduct of the emergence of the capitalist mode of production. Uh, that is not to say that democracy didn't exist in other societies before that. Uh, you know, the, we all know about uh, ancient Greece. Uh, we also know about uh, Iroquois society in, in North America. The feudal value system, uh, rooted as it was in the acceptance of a divinely ordered social hierarchy, surely could not survive the encroachment of a new set of production relations that was smashing that same social hierarchy to smithereens. Uh, with the spread of market relations, some peasants began to function and to think of themselves as independent farmers whose economic fortunes were contingent on the decisions they themselves made about their own affairs. Merchants had always seen themselves in this way, and now they were making up a larger and increasingly influential segment of the population. Artisans, craftsmen, were also operating in more entrepreneurial ways and their thinking was evolving uh, accordingly. Capitalism promotes a mentality in which people are expected to and entitled to control their own lives. Uh, modernity, the idea that history is not a circular process but an unfolding trajectory of change, changing circumstances also encourages this view of the self because changing circumstances present us with choices that need to be made uh, and in making those choices, we assert our individuality. So people who think of the world and, them, and themselves in this way will want to have a say in shaping the rules uh, that govern their interactions with other people. Uh, so Marx talks about how uh, <coughs> capitalism has to uh, develop to a particular stage uh, uh, to the point where uh, it, its productive capabilities uh, can, uh, can make socialism viable, right? And I think uh, there's a parallel development going on in the political realm, where capitalism creates a set of mentalities and political institutions uh, that, that are possible tools for uh, uh, the implementation of socialism. You get to socialism uh, through democracy. And, and Marx is a little bit ambivalent about democracy himself. Uh, sometimes he speaks as though, uh, well, it's a good thing, but, but it's not necessary. It's not going to get us where we want to get. And at other times he thinks, he talks as though that's, that's the way to go. That's the way to get to. Uh, to where we want to be. But right from the start, uh, there was a tension between this bourgeois presumption of political entitlement and the interests of capital. 
So in the aftermath of the English Civil War, the anti-royalists debated who should be enfranchised. Cromwell and his allies, all of whom were wealthy uh, property owners, argued that the right to vote should be subject to a property qualification on the ground that if uh, people who didn't have property were permitted to vote, they would undoubtedly seek to deprive the affluent of their wealth, uh, a prospect that Cromwell likened to anarchy. And that idea actually resurfaced during the, the Reagan years. Uh, uh, people put it forward as, as uh, you know, something that should be taken seriously as a constitutional uh, revision. Uh, it, the idea is below the surface of those remarks that got Mitt Romney into trouble in uh, an earlier election cycle, about the 47% who don't pay tax, right? Um, and you're, you're hearing it, you know, you can Google this and you'll, you'll see all kinds of hits for uh, a, a property requirement or you have to be able to pay taxes uh, before you should be allowed to vote and so on and so forth. Uh, so that idea was, uh, was there from the beginning and it's interesting that uh, uh, nobody ever uh, presented the opposite point of view, uh, which is that uh, Yes, perhaps, uh, but you know what? If only people who own property are allowed to vote, they will always vote in ways that undermine the well-being of people who don't own property. Uh, there were some voices that made this argument. The levelers spoke up for free people of modest means, uh, and their views are, uh, are expressed in a few quotations that I've written down here, but let me, let me read just a couple of them. Uh, this is Richard Overton in 1647. It must be the poor, the simple, and mean things of this earth that must confound the mighty and the strong. I like that quote. And uh, another, uh, <laughs> Thomas Rainsborough, uh, argued uh, that, uh, well, he, he made the argument that I just described a second ago. Confining the franchise to the wealthy would enable the affluent to consolidate their power and inflict hardship on the economically vulnerable. So uh, here's what he wrote. One part shall make hewers of wood and drawers of water of the majority, and so the greatest part of the nation shall be enslaved. Um, Cromwell and his faction won that debate, and progress towards expansion of the franchise was fitful. Uh, in England, there was no progress for nearly two centuries until the Reform Act of 1832 increased the franchise from 8% of the male population to 15%. Uh, and that was after, you know, the Peterborough Massacre and, and riots, you know. So the idea that sometimes is suggested that, that capitalism leads ineluctably to democracy <coughs> is... Uh, I think a little bit fishy. Uh, uh, people had to fight for it. What capitalism does is it cultivates this, this attitude that we have a right to uh, representation, to participate in the governance of our lives, uh, and then capital fights against the exercise of that right uh, uh, with tooth and claw. Uh, the Chartists tried to move things forward in 1838. They didn't get anywhere. And it was only until 1920 that universal suffrage was achieved in the UK. Things were similar in the United States. Uh, in the immediate aftermath of the War of Independence, there was, there was a property qualification for voting. And we only achieved universal male suffrage for whites uh, by the 1830s. Um, white men. White men, yes. And uh, my next statement is that women were guaranteed the right to vote only in the 1920s. Uh, the voting rights of blacks were not legally protected until the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Uh, as I say, progress was fitful, but progress did occur. Uh, I think the fitful progress and the recent steps backwards, of which we are all acutely aware, can be usefully analyzed as instances of capitalism's internal contradictions. In this case, in the ideological sphere, capitalism cultivates an ideology that teaches people, well, capitalism cultivates an ideology that teaches people to find meaning in their work, 
And then it creates mostly shitty jobs that are meaningless, or it cultivates management structures that make the job seem meaningless. Uh, similarly, it fosters an idea of the person as an autonomous entity with the right to participate in political life in meaningful ways, but broad-based political engagement uh, always carries the possibility of constraining the prerogatives of capital through legislation, regulation, and taxation, and capital fights back with all the tools at its disposal. And I think that's what, uh, what John's paper is about. What we're witnessing in the present moment uh, is, I think, the culmination of a confrontation that has been festering since the end of the post-war golden age, a breakdown of democratic institutions that parallels the dysfunctions of capitalism's economic mechanisms. Uh, John has laid out many of the ways in which democracy is being eroded uh, by the mechanisms of modern capitalism, and I'll just elaborate a little bit further by way of, of wrapping up my comments. Uh, you may all be familiar with Edmund, Edmund Burke's famous uh, comment to his constituents in 1774 that your representative owes you not his industry only, but his judgment, and he betrays you instead of serving you if he sacrifice, sacrifices it to your opinion. Uh, and what he was saying is, well, I'm, you know, I represent you, but I'm not here to do your bidding. I, you elected me, uh, you elected me to exercise my judgment in, in public affairs. And this remark is sometimes characterized as elitist, uh, but I think it, in fact, is a morally uh, defensible stance. Electors have the option of turning their representatives out of office if he or she cannot persuade them that his judgments warrant their support. What is unique about the present situation is that politicians are not exercising their judgment against the wishes of their constituents. They are recklessly failing to exercise any judgment at all in pursuit of political objectives that are transparently harmful to the well-being of their constituents. And, you know, open a newspaper any day and you can see examples of this. Uh, the tax law that was recently passed by America's Congress and then signed by President Trump uh, is a prime example of that. Uh, no one could possibly argue that any judgment went into the, was <coughs> behind the politics of the drafting of that law. Uh, the effort to repeal the Affordable Care Act and deprive tens of millions of people of access to health care without putting anything in its place, that was not driven by any act of judgment. Uh, environmental laws, a stonewalling of, of uh, uh, progress on global warming, uh, that is not the exercise of judgment. The people in Congress, the I'm, I'm sure their ability and their ethics uh, follow uh, some kind of normal distribution. I am also pretty sure that when they were growing up, their parents did not tell them, this is how you make serious decisions about serious things. And that is what suggests to me that, that what we're going through now is, is something pretty unique something unusual, uh, because to override, uh, you know, ethical principles that are, uh, ethical norms that are presumably deep-seated, because they're, they're entrenched in the moral, in the bourgeois values that permeate our society, right, for, for our political system to repeatedly override the, those, uh, those moral precepts, and those, those bourgeois rules about exercising common sense, uh, I think that is indicative of some kind of really serious uh, breakdown. Uh, two more points. Uh, I would take issue with your contention that neoclassical economics is intrinsically reactionary. Uh, I, I don't think it is. I think uh, the golden age was built on uh, policies grounded in neoclassical principles, uh, including neoclassically filtered Keynesianism. Uh, yes, you can disagree with it, you can have some issues with how they interpret Keynes, but I think it was uh, 
essentially progressive. I would argue that the socialist calculation debates of the 30s uh, indicate that, that neoclassical economics is not intrinsically reactionary. You know, <coughs> neoclassical economics was true. It would be the best argument in favor of socialism there could be. Those, those, that work was really uh, impressive. Um, I want to leave time for discussion, so I'll, 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 well, I have some handwritten scrawls here that are better left unsaid. I will stop here. Uh, very thought-provoking comments. To quote John Weeks, capital must be placed under permanent house arrest in order to defend democracy. And Gary is saying, well, what is democracy? And what's the relationship? So I would like to open the floor to discussion and then come back to the presenters. Anybody want to jump in? <laughs> I think just briefly, uh, we we'll let everybody else to speak. I think the embedded and the, and the need of what John talks about <coughs> and how uh, Gary is uh, confronting is focusing on class. The class is important. And we have been engaged in this. We have seen it on the TV programs. We have seen it on the engagement in the Congress. This is a class war which is going on. <coughs> the reflection of this uh, passage of the, uh, you know, uh, recent passage of this uh, uh, thing is a reflection of the class war. It's a reflection of, you know, we talk about individualism and individuals at the center of you know, classical economics, but it's just the tip of the iceberg. The class is at the foundation. Uh, right, I guess I want to ask a question. John mentioned this uh, class rule by consent period, 1930s, 1970s. That was the time period of the largest, uh, we say, most productive increase in resource consumption, particularly energy consumption, and essentially the history of mankind. So, so my question is, not that it's theoretically impossible to have more equality without more resource consumption, but is it a practical constraint? How much easier is it to have democracy uh, or more equal rule if you have more resources to share versus if you don't more Okay, let me take a few more. Yeah. Uh, I slowly have realized that, that freedom, of course, I think most of us knew this is a loaded term and it's been captured by, by, the, by the right. Uh, and yet, at the same time, democracy, I'm guilty of having been too loose with my use of it. So I'd like any comments you might have on the, uh, the evolving nature of, of that uh, idea. Uh, I think it's always been out there, but it's not altogether clear to me even now what is being intended by, by, uh, by that. Yes. So um, I, had, I had a question about uh, the fiscal policy and the interaction with democracy. The thing that, that came to mind was uh, Prop 13 in California, which is perhaps the most famous example, at least in the US, of the exercise of direct democracy. So Prop 13, 1978 passed of the huge margin to one that was one that strongly restricted taxation in California. Right? That was one that limited the property tax increase and also required a two-thirds majority for the passage of any new tax increase. Um, and the sort of narrative behind why that happened was because people were really tired of really high levels of taxation and thought it was more sort of captured by the politicians. And they wanted to sort of restrict their ability to do, to tax and spend as they wanted. So in the sense, I, I don't quite know how this fits in with the sort of idea that restrictions on fiscal policy is bad or somehow not, not sort of, so direct democracy in a sense seems to me a, a case of pure democracy, right? In the case where you just literally ask people on a single issue what they want and the answer here was very strong. And even in the two to three years before when they did polling, polls also showed really strong support for this type of restriction on fiscal policy. And eventually it, it got passed. So, <laughs> what is, 
two of you think about something like this in terms of both the interaction of, of in terms of both democracy and in terms of both fiscal policy restrictions being sort of a, a negative <coughs> thing what the government can do. Okay, uh, I, I can't let this, Gary's last remark go unpassed. And I, I did miss uh, John, the early part of John, John's lecture, so I, 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 my guess is you probably addressed this and you will probably comment on this in your, in your response. But um, uh, the, the, the neoclassical economics, even in its heyday, constructs a framework uh, in which the economy is self-adjusting, the economy is optimizing. It, it, and you, you've emphasized uh, how uh, capitalism leads to kind of democratic mindsets or ways of thinking, at least among you know a certain you know certainly the bourgeoisie initially and so forth. Uh, but but the the ideology that we today teach as the standard economic curriculum does the opposite. It says you know leave it to the market. The market is God, and and that I think is is really fundamental to, to what's going on, to, to certainly the, the legitimation of the, the financial takeover that John was addressing and, and many of the other evils. So I, I do not think that it is, uh, it was progressive even in its heyday to the extent that it, it was promoting that, that kind of thinking. That, that was not progressive thinking. Okay, so now we have uh, Neoclassical economics is really freedom, but no, 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 it's really not freedom. Okay, John. <laughs> right. Um, first, on resource uh, control and democracy, when I think about that, if I can argue concrete, I think that social democracy in the 21st century uh, has to restrict uh, uh, resource use. And uh, so, for example, uh, one thing you find uh, uh, in the <coughs> late 45 platform is large investments in uh, public transport. They haven't quite gone to the point of restrictions on uh, private automobile. But that has to be the next step. So, so I think that you have to have restrictions on consumption. I think that is the case. And I think it's an ideological argument to make, but I think that the situation uh, is such that um, um, inequality is so great that the illusion of happiness through consumption, which very much, as you suggest, um, fueled um, uh, the golden age, I think um, uh, that is less uh, a strong uh, now. Very large number of families in Britain, I presume in the United States, do, are struggling to get the basic uh, necessities. So I think arguments for social provision can have a practical impact. Whether your point is true in more abstract and long-term sense, I would have to think about that. Um, democracy, what is it? Well, that, that's, a good, um, that's a good question. I'm working on this because it's, I, out of this, I hope to publish a book called, um, the same, uh, same as my lecture I'm working on, we have some, uh, support from the Ford Foundation for it. Um, perhaps if I could combine that with the next one about Proposition 13. You know, I was growing up in Texas, there was this joke that went around and said, uh, uh, um, uh, Texas is a lot more democratic than most states. Uh, for example, in Arkansas, in order to be elected a state judge, you have to have a law degree. In Texas, any damn fool could run for judge. Uh, so I'm not for, I'm restricted. I think Arkansas is right. I don't think you need to let any damn fool run. Uh, but, but I do think that people should, representatives should be able to do stupid things, you know. So I don't think we ought to have rules restricting fiscal policy. Now let's take Proposition 13 specifically. I'm against referendums. I'm against referendums because, well first of all, there's a Brexit referendum which had a disastrous outcome, not in economic terms. People who say that Brexit is going to be a, a disastrous for the British economy, that is a neoliberal argument because what they're saying is 
oh my God, we aren't going to have free trade with Europe and we're just going to go down the toilet. It's a disaster because it fosters xenophobia, racism, and it, will under, it could undermine worker rights. And for all of the really seriously bad things in the European treaties, there are protections or civil rights, human rights, that would be lost. Okay. How then was that referendum lost? And I think that it, uh, this is relevant to Proposition 13. It was lost because a lot of money was poured in to spread lies, I'm not going to use the euphemism, misinformation, disinformation, just to spread lies. By the way, crucial to that uh, was the Russian government, without doubt. The Russian government wanted to see that <coughs> Russian defeated, and they, I don't know if they were critical in it, but they were very happy with it was uh, lost. Okay, so I think the th I'm against referendums because I don't think you get a reasonable debate. I'm for representative democracy. That's why I tried to use that term. And that takes me back to, uh, back to your point. What is democracy? I think increasingly I'm turning the position that it very much, that there's an abstract quality certainly to it, uh, but there's a very concrete uh, uh, aspect of it too. And one way you see it in Britain is now the Labour Party is being forced to, to be democratized through a grassroots movement called Momentum, which has its problems and has its ideologues and has its uh, uh, bickering and so on. But politicians have realized that this movement can help you get elected. You know, a grassroots movement, <coughs> appealing to a grassroots movement, rather than doing it through an elite top-down movement, can be a successful electoral strategy. And so I know that's avoiding your question, but I think that uh, 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 grassroots democracy coming through elected representatives. Very briefly on neoclassical uh, economics, is it reactionary? I think it is, actually. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I uh, <laughs> won't be polite. Uh, <laughs> I, and, in, uh, uh, in this yeah. book of mine, Economics of the 1%, I have a chapter where I try to, in lay person's terms, uh, explain that. And in a sense, I would put it this way. Neoclassical economics is the economics of full employment. What we call microeconomics completely collapses if you don't have full employment. Because if you don't have full employment, then there are idle resources. And if there are idle resources, the price of those resources should be zero. Okay, so this is a very, very special case. It may or may not be useful in the case of socialism. Uh, having never lived in a centrally planned economy, I can't really comment on that. But for us to teach a theory of price determination that is pre presents full employment, uh, is politically very reactionary. And the reason it is, is because it is coming out of that is the whole trade-off argument, right? If there are idle resources, then you can only have more of something, you have uh, less of something else. And this trade-off argument goes, uh, <coughs> you see it actually also in some Marxist analysis. The, <coughs> the profit rate can only go up if the wage rate goes down. It's the economics of full employment. Uh, so I think that if you can come up with a version of neoclassical economics, which is not the economics of full employment, then it wouldn't necessarily be reactionary. But everyone who has talked about less than full employment economics, and there are lots of people, that's not Keynesianism, that's sensible economics, you know, all the way uh, back there to uh, uh, go back to Hobson and uh, uh, other go back to Marx, go back to Ricardo, uh, then uh, uh, then you have the possibility of a progressive uh, economics. But as long as you're on full employment, 
I think you you can't get to a progressive outcome. Uh, yeah, um, on the evolving nature of democracy and the relation between the democracy and, and liberty, uh, uh, this is partly what I meant when I was talking about fitful progress. Uh, I think that uh, I was reading Schumpeter's Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy, preparing some of these comments, and it's very interesting because he talks particularly about the compatibility of socialism with democracy, but he has a lot of interesting discussions in that, that context. Um, and he points out that in every democracy, you, that system has to make decisions about who's going to be enfranchised. Uh, should it be people over the age of 21? Should we lower the voting age to 18? Well, there's something arbitrary about that. Why shouldn't 16-year-olds be allowed, right? Uh, for long stretches of time, people of particular races were not allowed to vote. Uh, the franchise was denied to, to women. And as, as there are cultures which have a religious condition on voting, as the system evolves, uh, so do, does the understanding of what democracy means. Uh, and I think that's that's what's happened in Western democracy. The idea of barring people of a particular sex or a particular race from voting would now be regarded as repugnant by almost every, I won't say everybody, but almost everybody. And what got me interested was this thought that there are people who think it's perfectly fine to bar people from voting who are too poor to pay taxes. Right or who don't have jobs. Uh, uh, on the issue of liberty, of course, we, we, we place limitations, constitutional limitations, on democracy in order to preserve certain values that we think are important. And you know, one of the, the interesting things about, about what John was saying is that a lot of things that most of us would regard are, uh, as important are being totally hammered by democracy. They're not protected by the particular constraints that, that we have placed on democracy. And that's something that needs to be addressed. And then one last point, because uh, it connects this to the issue of, of uh, whether <laughs> neoclassical economics is reactionary. Uh, there are strains of mainstream economics that are truly reactionary. One is constitutional political economy, which is basically what you were talking about. It wants to bar democracy from addressing those particular values, economic values, that, that most of us, most of us agree, uh, should be valued. Uh, we have discussed this uh, in the past. Uh, you know, I, I don't, what neoclassical theory does is that it identifies the conditions necessary for the market economy to produce the outcomes we want, okay? To provide for people and achieve efficiency and achieve full employment. Those conditions are so stringent that what neoclassical economics shows is that we have to intervene to get the system to, to work the way we want it to. This is not to say that neoclassical reasoning about how markets work are correct. Uh, the idea about self-correcting or self-regulating, markets are to some degree self-regulating. That's not to say that they produce optimal outcomes. <coughs> but we do not live in a chaotic world, by and large. Uh, you know, markets coordinate to some degree. And I think that's a, a valid insight shared by Marx Marx's predecessors and neoclassical economists. So perhaps one closing comment because we're out of time. Uh, I think David Gordon's legacy and John Weeks' example show that activism and getting engaged and organizing is essential to progressive outcomes, n no matter which theory you're going to use. So organize. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. I was worried all that time. Yeah, yeah, I'll leave it. I love Boston.
stuff? Uh, I I think think yeah. Yeah. Oh, you did? Oh, for right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I did the yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm trying yeah. to remember what I'm doing. 90 miles north. Uh, yeah. It's a good session. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, 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 yeah.